Hi, everybody. Welcome to the fourth NFT subgraph call. Um, we took a, a week off last week and uh, we're back. Um, and uh, we've got a few new people on the call today. Um, if uh, anyone wants to just give a shout out and uh, share either about their company or, or what they're working on, um, let's, we can do a, a round of intros if there's, if there's anybody new. Hi everyone, um, I'm Meta. I'm helping out with the foundation team. Uh, nice to meet you all. Hey, nice to meet you. And, and uh, I guess, did you, uh, you contributed mostly to the uh, to that Google doc that was sent out? Oh yeah, I just consolidated all the previous notes, yeah. Cool, yeah, thanks, thanks for doing that. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Hello everybody. Um yeah, I'm here because I created the generic, uh, super simple generic ERC721 subgraph so that others can just fork and uh, and do their custom implementation. And I should join this call. Hey, Simon. And uh, you used to be at Enzyme. Back when it was Melon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was Melon Port back then, and uh, I worked there as a front-end engineer or head of front-end actually, yeah. Very cool. Uh, all right, well, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's jump in. Before we start, just a uh, little house cleaning. So, you know, we've got, or housekeeping, <laughs> we've got this uh, NFT air table uh, set up. If you don't have access, just, uh, you know, shoot me a message. And uh, here we're, we're uh, tracking all the different um, NFTs that we want to have subgraphs for. Um, so I see that uh, people added a few more. And, um, and, and if anyone has a chance to go through and just kind of update the status on any of these, if, um, if they're um, still like to do, or uh, if there, you know, there, there's some already deployed that are basic or complete, uh, we can just track this and, uh, and make sure that we get all of these subgraphs uh, built and out there. Um, uh, big thing that we've been focusing on um, in the last few calls has been standardization. And uh, we've talked about uh, a few of these different areas um, that we can standardize on. And um, you know, one of the, uh, the things that we, we discussed was how um, you know, for, for many of these, there's a difference between um, kind of the ERC standard for um, the on-chain data, uh, data and uh, what we're now calling the GRCs, or, um, which is basically the, the graph equivalent of standards at the, the subgraph level. And so um, you know, it's something that uh, we can continue to look at where it might be that it's worth creating some new um, ERCs for, for the parts that are on chain. Um, and then um, you know, looking separately at uh, what the standard should be at the API layer um, with, with the subgraph schemas. Um, so we had some great discussions on the last call, and I think we can just jump straight into it um, to go over um, some of the proposed um, standards for you know, the, the contracts data, uh, the NFT data, and uh, you know, this ever-growing metadata field um, to see uh, if, if uh, you know, we can Get some alignment on um, on some of these fields. So um, I'd say I know the uh, the foundation team uh, did some some great work on this uh, since the last call. And uh, would you guys want to uh, kick that off? Yeah. So I, I think um, so. Meta compiled a bunch of the notes from the last um, from the last call, and maybe I can just share this my screen and, and walk through that for people that may not have the context. So everybody see this? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this was, um, this is the doc where we're trying to consolidate like just everything that has been discussed. Uh, there's quick links to the Telegram group and the Airtable. Um, I'm not gonna go through, so last time we talked about metadata, creator field and fees. I'm not gonna go through those in too much detail and I'm actually gonna jump down here to the general subgraph schema, um, which, which Ryan um, from Upchat proposed. And I, I think this is actually a, 
um, a great starting point and we've actually hashed out a bunch of things. Um, so I think here we, we have a uh, subgraph entity for what a contract should look like or what an NFT should look like. Um, and we've delineated, you know, just what lives on the contract itself. So the name and symbol, those are um, not necessarily NFT specific things, but like are more attributes of the contract. And then for the NFT, um, we're saying, okay, the creator should be an account. There should be a creator fee um, that's self-reported. Um, and that could be a fee, fee entity we can hash out as well. Um, and then metadata is, is like another thing that we can, we can hash out. But I'd say let's start here because I, I think we kind of ended the last call with general alignment that this is the right direction. Um, but I, I would say, let's make sure that this is what we want and then we can drill into each of the entities that we have not fleshed out. Does that make, would that make sense to people? Ryan, is there anything you, you wanna add here? No, I'm on board. I think this is a good place to start. I have, um, I can drop in the uh, sale event, transfer event and account entities that are kind of off the grid right now. Cool, yeah, I, I think getting again, I think getting those on paper as strawman and using that to, um, to drive discussion will be helpful. Sure. Would you be able to uh, paste it right in maybe at the bottom of the document? On it. Awesome. Yeah, let me make sure. Brian, what's your, here, let me, just, let me just send the link over. All right, and uh, I, I saw a, a comment in that document where um, I think Adam was asking, uh, you know, if there were some fields that were added to that top level just for convenience, um, because I, I guess that, that data was um, also included somewhere else. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, general philosophy, I think for kind of subgraph schema design is that it's actually okay to have some duplication. You know, I think it's, it's different than like database ta tables or something where you wanna have the data normalized. Uh, I think at the API layer, um, it actually makes sense to have different fields that are either like computed data or, you know, things like that, that, you know, are just kind of for convenience uh, because that's, that's part of what you're able to do at that layer is kind of you know explode the data out and just make sure that it's available in the most convenient format uh, for for the application developer. Cool. Yeah, Ryan, I see you added uh, account, sell event, and transfer event. Cool. Yeah, just a scaffold we can build over. Cool. Yeah, and. Um, and I, I just, uh, there was a, a message from Hadrian in the chat saying, you know, if everybody does that, then all subgraphs will have a, a contract entity. And it'll have different meanings. And so that's, that's also a fair point. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a balance, you know, I think with any kind of design, um, you know, you, you want to do the, the proper kind of data modeling. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a, a trade-off there that you know, I think API designers can kind of work through. So I think I think we can give people time to people can absorb the context for the earlier parts of this doc, but maybe um, are there other reactions to the contract and NFT entity before we drill deeper into the other entities that are, are kind of mentioned here? One proposal I had for the NFT ID would be the concatenated string of the contact or contract address slash token ID. But I'm not clear on how you want to concatenate that. Yeah, th th this is an area where I think, um, you know, we're interested in adding some, some new tools to, to help people with um, how they generate IDs. Um, you know, uh, I think that the concatenation thing has been a, a pretty common pattern. Um, and uh, I, like, I wonder how people think about, you know, their, their IDs here in these schemas. Um, you know, generally the, the point of them is to be unique. Um, do people assume in their applications that these IDs are like stable and don't change? Or, you know, is it something where, 
you know, if, if in your subgraph, you just changed one day how the IDs were computed, would that break anything in your applications? I like kind of the one-to-one -one against the OpenSea URL. So mm -hmm. at OpenSea, you can go to slash contract slash token ID. And it's nice if you kind of internally consider that the ID, but you yeah. could abstract like an auto ID from a metadata URI. Okay, so so in this case, there's actually a, a, a reason why contract ID token ID is, is an especially good ID. I, I would say another reason why um, events data concatenated as an ID is very important is because of the constraint that you can only load by ID. So if you want to update a, a given entity in the middle of uh, a handler, you need to be able to fetch that ID based off of the event information. And so if you know the token ID, for example, then you can grab that NFT entity and make the necessary updates that you want. Um, so that, that was the primary motivation for why in the Zora subgraph, we, we do that kind of stuff, at least. Well, it makes sense. Also, hey, everyone, sorry for missing the last week or so. Uh, I feel a little out of the loop, but um, I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks for making it. I think it, it it helps to get everybody, you know, in the same virtual room. Um, yeah, to, yeah, get 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 to consensus. So cool. What, like, what do we think are, are maybe the more controversial parts of um, you know the schema here? And um, and I think people should feel totally fine bike shedding. You know, I think uh, you know when you're when you're trying to get a feature out the door, bad time to bike shed. Uh, you know, when, when, when you've got everybody, you know, working towards uh, standards, that's, that is the time to go to town. Um, I have a couple of high level questions and maybe a couple net. Uh, the first question is, is for the metadata contract. Um, maybe this was talked about last week, the week before, but I'm super familiar with contract metadata. I think one good example is maybe on the CryptoPunks contract, you have the SHA-256 of all the CryptoPunks. So it's not belonging to any one entity, but to the set of all of them. Okay, cool. Ryan, what was this again? Is a hash of all the, what, what did you say CryptoPunks has? Yeah, they have for every crypto punk, they have like the the sum of all of the punks is one large image and then the hash of that image to verify that it is the right contract, I guess. Uh, but it's okay. one thing where it's it's definitely contract metadata. Yeah. That said, it's a non-standard contract, so. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining, um, Neve, let me know this is off, like a lot of the stuff, like I think we should drill into what um, what's useful. And then I think there's probably also a conversation around like what's required and what's optional, right? So I think for mm -hmm. most of us, probably the contract metadata is not that useful, but then the NFT metadata, it is useful. And so yeah. I think the contract, contract le le level, like this is probably optional, but then this is probably required down here. And that that's what the bang's for, right? So, so if it's... Uh... If it's yep. optional, I just maybe remove the bang. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Think of. Oh, go ahead. ahead. Got it. Okay, I'll go. Um, a couple of other comments on NFT. Um, I, I'm a believer of we should store the block hash over the block number um, just like for forks and stuff and I, it looks like block I'm imagining is block number on this I had it as both so the number and the hash in case you want to sort by block number oh is, is hash is hash block hash yeah I should probably say block hash okay cool 
Yeah, like so. So we use like a. We, we have a couple of fields for like when things are created. So we have like a created at block number and like a created at timestamp. Um, and then we also have um, timestamps for like when things are burned. So I don't know how many uh, of the contracts that are standardized are um, inherit the ERC 721 burnable standard, but I think it's helpful to have like any of those like contract level events on a single NFT. Um, having just like explicit timestamps and block number relations and hashes so that people can derive when those things happened and make sure that things are, are correct. Yeah, now one thing that um, we're going to be working on is, uh, you know, I think we, we've talked about both of these features. Uh, one is network subgraphs. So like an Ethereum subgraph uh, where we're indexing the raw like blocks, transactions, accounts, all that kind of data. Uh, and then subgraph composition. Um, so it, it might be that um, ideally once we get those two features in, uh, what we have here is just like a reference to an actual like block or a transaction entity. You know, it could be like the, uh, it could be, it could be both. Mm -hmm. um, and then that way you could traverse and get all of the additional metadata about those raw blocks or transactions. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. And I think it is, I, I like the idea of being explicit that these are for the, the mint and then we can have a separate one that references like the burn um, if that if that does happen. Mm -hmm. So these are, yeah, this so would be. Mint block. Yeah, this is like. Which I think, um, Hadrian, I see your comment here. I think the intent is like, this is for the mint, right? Right, right? Yeah. Correct. Are there, are there lots of events where you want to reference the blocks or is it really just those two events? I've got it on everything. So anytime something happens, when? Yeah, same. Yeah, so I see it down here for the sale event and the transfer event, right? So I, I guess, is, is this like a convenient air, you know, place where because it's just so common, it's worth having that data, you know, on the NFT itself versus kind of like having events, including like a mint event and kind of having that data there? It's nice too, just if you're going to plot this and if you want to plot the purchases, got to have timestamps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think uh, you need you're asking why why sales and transfer are not like mint as like a separate thing here, and I think it's because mint and burn happen once, whereas right. sales and transfer can happen multiple times. Makes sense. I think not a lot of NFT contracts support this, but would an update event make sense if a creator were to update the metadata prior to like listing it for sale? Yeah. I was thinking for a creator and creator fee, while I hope everyone includes those, those could be candidates for being optional. So a couple, couple of directions I think we can take this. I, I think meta, NFT metadata is a big hairy one. Um, so maybe we save that for um, later, but like a transfer event, I think is pretty straightforward. Sale event, I know um, there's been concern over before uh, in terms of just like uh, how, how standard it is across all NFTs. Uh, do we wanna chat about sale event first and then go into the metadata? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, Hot takes on sale event. Breck, I know you had concern last time. Yeah, um, 
I, I saw a proposal that I thought was really interesting about like having a notion of like general fee recipients. I, I don't know how that conversation went last time, but um, I can speak selfishly in Zora, there's more than just a, um, a buyer and a seller. There are actually multiple entities potentially that can receive or be the recipients of a successful sale. Um, so obviously in my, in my book, in my, or from my perspective, I'd love for it to be more general, but, um, yeah, honestly have not thought enough about it. Um, I know that I was sort of tasked <laughs> with doing this, but things have gotten a little crazy in the last couple of weeks. So I apologize. I mean, would we be able to spitball a bit? So like, what's, what are the different types of, uh, participants? Yeah, so in Azora NFT, there are three participants. There's an owner, so the current owner of the NFT. There's the creator. And then there is this notion of the previous owner. And so in the contract in storage, there is like bid shares or what we call the shares of, of the sale for all of those participants. Um, the creator and the owner are like obligatory. And the previous owner is depending on the, like the provenance of the NFT. And so whenever a sale is, uh, is finalized before, like, as a part of um, the finalization of a sale, it like will split the sale up into the, the necessary shares for each individual entity and transfer to each entity uh, discreetly. So it's not just a buyer and a seller in this case. Yeah. So is, is this a place where it would make sense to have different types of sale events and maybe there's like an interface and, you know, if it's, uh, would you call it a, a, a ZNFT or a ZFT? Um, if it's, if it's that type of NFT, then use, you know, this other type of sale event. Ooh, and like an, an, an Azora NFT is composed of multiple sale events. Um, and I think this is also nice for like a regular NFT sale where there's an owner and a creator as well, where it's composed of two different sale events, right? And maybe, maybe the fields can be more generalized, not like buyer and seller, but like, I don't know, recipient and, and then another word for buyer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't want to hijack the conversation as well, um, but that's an interesting thought. I like the idea of having like almost even like a subunit, like sale event is a subunit and you can have numerous sale events and like an actual sale. I don't know. The seller could be like proprietors and then you could have some kind of array of that pie chart of the previous owners. I wonder if um, there's something we could do with the ID, the ID. So there's a couple groupings already built in, um, right? We have the, the, we have the block um, and we have a transaction, we have the hash, transaction hash. And so maybe like I'm in favor of like turning this into like an interface uh, and basically like most people would just use the vanilla sale event. But then if you're, if you are um, building things that are, um, that have a little more uh, functionality than what, what you can do, for example, like breakfast, I think for Zora, you, you could probably just have the same transaction hash just happens to have multiple sell events and you're just reporting each of those events separately. And then if you're needing more fields, you could extend the sell event interface um, to add those fields for your uh, Zora specific sell events. Um, but then everybody else will like, consumers will be able to just walk through all sell events and not have to know the underlying implementation. Yeah, no, I think that makes a ton of sense. Okay. And then would the buyer and seller be part of the interface or would that be, you know, there's like a standard sale event or something and then, or, or you know, a different name for the different types? Yeah, we, I think, um, I, I think majority of NFTs will probably just have like buyer and seller, but then I think for, for example, for the Zora case, um, this is where maybe you can add a field that's like the, uh, previous owner or something like that and then you leave one of these fields blank and um and then i think th at that point it'd be a conversation between like zora and whoever's consuming their sub graph on like how to interpret that yeah and I, I think there could still be a conversation about if it makes sense to uh 
to just change the names a little bit so that it, it would work for both use cases. I think that that could still be on the table. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I tend to agree. How do you, how do you all envision um, creator share? Like in the case where a sale leads to the creator receiving some funds back, um, maybe this is a, a general misunderstanding that I have in how the mechanics of that work on other marketplaces, but is that included in the sale event or is that its own sale event? That's a good question. I mean, one thing we could also do to make it more explicit opening here and feedback here is like, there could be like a, um, like a fee event or like a, like a royalty event, right. Where you're, there's like marketplace fees that everybody is collecting. And then the, there's royalty that goes to the creator. Um, and that could be his own event. And, um, we don't have to lump into sale because I think the sale event, if I'm understanding correctly for, for platforms, say like for upshot for whoever you guys are probably using this to figure out like when the NFT changes hands. Right. So I don't, I don't want to pollute that with too much uh, metadata with too much data. Yeah. That'll factor into the appraisal of an NFT. Right. But I like the idea of a royalty. So this can be like a, let me know if people have other better names for, uh, for this, but this is basically like a fee event. Um, and is, and this, go ahead, is the thinking of putting a royalty in every event that like, even if creator fee is global for the contract or global for a particular creator, that it, it might be updatable. So you'll want the historical record of like, if it was updated for past events, what the fee was at the time. I think, I think that makes sense if that's what the thinking is. I, w I would think so. And would and would a sale event be, like have fee events, or or are they discrete? I don't, I just don't have enough knowledge of of how other contracts work. But to me, that makes sense. I assume the royalties of the fees are associated with the sale. That makes that sense right? to me. It could be derived from. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah, totally. This is a. some live coding for you guys here <laughs> this is actually quite nice i think actually is this right is am i doing the derive from right uh i think so okay and then breck with with the combination of like the interface here and the fee events here, um, would that help? Yeah, I think that's, I think that works for us. Um, one in, in a fee event, is there a, who is, so, so who is the, the, the party that is giving the fee? It feels like there needs to be another field. That's like the, I don't know the name for this, but that, that is bequeathing the fee to the recipient. <laughs> Up, send a recipient, but open a feedback. Yeah, sender works. Um, and then maybe another thing is like the currency. I don't, I, I don't know. This is another net, and this is another specific thing for Zora. But we accept bids in any currency. Um, and so generally, whenever we use amounts, we also like are explicit in the currency field. And I imagine as ERC 721 evolves, more contracts will also, or, you know, market contracts will accept bids and, you know, transfers and stuff in arbitrary currencies. So we might want to add that as well. How do we handle uh, protocol upgrades for currencies like side to die, for instance, would we use address or a short name or other? Yeah, I, I think address is definitely the, the, the primary key, uh, but then dealing with ETH, um, I, I don't know how you would deal with ETH natively. This, yeah. This is another was, one where, where I'd love to have like a separate uh, subgraph, you know, with entities for like, you know, I don't know if it'd be tokens or coins or assets. Yeah. I guess it, I guess it'd be assets. 
And then you could just reference like the the asset across subgraphs, like like uh, you know we mentioned with with the block. Eventually. Yeah, and I, I think we we had a notion of currencies in, in foundations v one, and we use zero for for ETH. So I think that's that's probably what we yeah. There we go. Seems cool. like Seba is saying the same thing. So this could be um, what would this be address or contract. And we probably have it up here as well. Yeah, and then that way we can easily move into like an actual currency entity that's provided by the graph in a future date. Right. I, I know Uniswap does something similar where they actually like pull in all the native fields. So they'll fetch like pertinent data from the ERC-20 contracts, um, things like the symbol, the decimals, et cetera. But it sounds like we don't need to do any of that stuff necessarily. I see uh, anonymous. Oh, is this Hadrian? Is you in here? Did you want to talk about what you're writing? Yeah, your fee events, transfer events, and everything, they all have a lot of stuff in common. So you should put that under an interface. Got it. Agree. Mm hmm. It's a good idea because you will be able to get all the events for a particular NFT. So you can use a different front on the NFT or the contract. Yeah, I'm just going to make you guys, I'm going to let you guys all edit in here. Please make sure if you're sharing, this doesn't get on so wild and, and cause a bunch of mess, but uh, you guys should all have edit access now. Um, I know the OpenSea team looks like Dan and um, Dan's in here from OpenSea. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if, if, if you guys have any, any thoughts on these, because I, I know you guys have dealt with a bunch of different currencies and like a bunch of different types of like trades and sales. Um, and I, I want to, I think you, you guys probably have perspective here on what a, a good schema might look like. Also, don't mean to put you on the spot, so do not feel like you have. <laughs> I uh, I haven't been tracking super closely. I apologize. If Devin is in here, he might be able to speak extemporaneously more effectively than I can. Um, but I think you guys have uh, definitely thought in a much more nuanced way about this than I have. Cool. Yeah. I mean, um, this this doc you guys should all have access. Uh, so you guys can review and absorb the context, and, and then I think. Uh, we can continue to, to work on this. Awesome. Do, feel, do people generally feel good about the sell event and fee event? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the library factoring. So as we, as we speak, it's getting better. <laughs> I think the same thing, I don't know if this comment already exists, but the block hash and timestamp things, um, it might honestly be nice to standardize it across all things that we save it on. It's just like, this is, these are the, these are all the block information that this, that this event was created at. So like, I know we use minted for, um, for NFT, but like created at, for all entities might just be more standard and easier to parse through and everyone knows what it is versus having different terminology for the same thing on different uh, entities. Yeah, that makes sense to me too. I mean, I think you need, what are you, are you guys um, like the chain native entities? Like, is that like a, is that coming soon? Like, should we, should we uh, design the entities sooner that that's going to come live or should we, I, for, for now, uh, I would I would assume it's not there. So I mean, we're we're going to be okay. working on it for a kind of Q three sort of time frame. Um, yeah. So it, I imagine you'll want to have this before then. Yeah. We could also okay. all. 
we can also like bake that into, I mean, like, we could have our own like block entity in here that we then migrate into like a native, like, yeah. graph native yeah. one too, right? Yeah, just, uh, and I, I guess you, you could stuff in all the relevant blocks. I mean, you don't need to have every single block, you know, ever mined, you know, it could just be like, you know, a block cache of all the blocks where NFT things have happened. Yeah. Which Good now is like every block. <laughs> yeah, we have from uh, from the last year forward for sure. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, love the live refactoring, and I think it sounds like we the general alignment on what the sale and fee events look like. I think um, we can hash out just like how to represent the transaction in the block. Uh, separately. Um, I think the next big thing to hash out is probably metadata. I know that's a hairy one. So are people ready to, to move on to that? I just wanted to add that, as I already said, in many of these calls, I have a library with tools that I linked again in the comments. And I already have standard uh, interfaces for events and transaction, that kind of stuff. I don't think I have something for block. But uh, I use it in all my subgraph and I invite you to extend. So yeah, you can, there is event and transaction and both have a CS file and a, so this is creating it and you've got a, a file that just defines it. And I've got a few yeah. of these. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this I think this is a great stepping stone for um, eventually getting to a point where like this is natively supported. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna move on to metadata. Um, and um, for this one, I'm, I'm actually gonna put Sam on, on the, uh, I'm gonna put Sam on um, to share a screen and, and walk through maybe, because Sam's put a lot of thought into metadata um, just because he's been interacting with a lot of different NFT platforms. Um, so we'd love for, for him to walk through kind of his, his thinking and his, his reasoning and figure out what we can drive to alignment on uh, as a group. Go. Cool. Thanks, LPZ. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yep. Cool. Um, Maybe just zoom in a little if you can command plus. Sure. Good, yeah, perfect, thanks. So, yeah, so this is kind of going over. Um, for those of you that were here two weeks ago, um, this is obviously the, the document that we shared out, um, from then and then shared in the uh, the, the telegram. Um, essentially, <clears throat> I think where we landed on um, at the end of that conversation was uh, following a similar solution that Zora is good actually to have. Uh, Breck on the call because a lot of this was stemming from uh, their concepts of how they've created these metadata schemas, which I think is a really solid uh, idea moving forward. Um, the idea was to essentially create like a bunch of what we could call like the core metadata standards for like our current use cases. So image, video, uh, audio, 3D, if we wanted to go uh, that specific. Um, but these are just JSON schemas. So they could essentially be kind of composed together with platform specific metadata. Um, the idea being that we could incorporate this obviously into subgraphs. Um, and because the JSON schemas can be introspected um, by just we uh, essentially apply a uh, kind of schema name and similar to how the Zora the SDK works where they have a repo that just collates them all together. And there's a function that can kind of reach out to those, pull down the metadata schema using a you know, JSON schema library, and then kind of understand like what fields are expected to be in the metadata, what fields are obviously optional or uh, mandatory. Um, I, think, I don't think there's been a huge amount um, built on top of this. Um, I tried to add some of the feedback that I got from last week, uh, from the last call that we had uh, into this by adding like, uh, optional 
uh, kind of params into the into these kind of mock interfaces or mock schemas. Uh, sorry, not mock schemas, mock kind of examples. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm kind of like I'd be interested, Breck, uh, to kind of get your take on it as well. Obviously, you guys have the the Zora one, so I'd be interested to kind of see what uh, what your lessons learned from that are. Yeah, um, I so high level thoughts. Um, I really like the idea of having a core schema for like an an image type or not image type, but a a type of content. Mm -hmm. um, right now, our schemas are definitely geared towards um, like platform specific metadata. So like if someone's building on Zora and they have, you know, like they're an audio platform or you're like a script writing platform or whatever, you might have your own metadata for your own platform use case. But I do think that like abstracting away the MIME type and including core pieces of metadata for a given MIME type is, is, a, is probably a better route. And that allows you to play with the most important things about how you consume the media and also be able to add that and contextualize it to your own platform specific metadata. Um, so, so I'm a big fan of, of this. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the one thing that I'm definitely less uh, familiar with, and we touched upon it at the end of the last call, is how to um, how this could be incorporated into a subgraph. Um, obviously, one way is, uh, I guess, there's a few different options, right? Like one way is there is uh, a URL leading out to this, which I guess is like how some things work now, where you just add in the metadata field in the subgraph, it would just link directly out to the metadata, and you'd have to do like passing of the schema and look up and everything like that another thing could be to kind of like uh potentially stringify or just dump the contents into the metadata field um as like a sub object potentially uh, if that's even possible i don't even know if that's even a thing that could happen or stringified uh and the other one i guess would be to kind of construct a uh a kind of entity uh similar to how uh the scheme.graphql like building our own scheme based on like a an introspected version of the schema and kind of like constructing it either dynamically or ahead of time um but i'd definitely be open i yeah i'm kind of very unopinionated about that step yeah i, I think you know definitely parsing the data you know is is the way to go so that you know you can actually query you know on specific mm -hmm. um you know fields uh, it's just a, a much more powerful way to go. Uh, I guess the, the first question I would have is, um, you know, uh, you mentioned having these uh, schemas for the individual types as like JSON schema, and then mm -hmm. having that something that's parsed later. Um, what other clients would be consumers of that JSON schema specifically, if, you know, all of that data was also kind of, um, you know, indexed this way? Yeah, so I guess if it's indexed purely, I mean, I definitely think that like the subgraph would be one client. Um, I think really the other use cases are other dApps, right, that are trying to kind of like pull down specific contracts. Like I would have been super helpful, for example, with like nfte.app, if there was a way that I could have kind of like gone ahead and pulled the schema, which related to some kind of JSON schema remotely, and then kind of understood what I would actually have access to ahead of time. Um, so in my eyes, it's kind of like any platform that's trying to consolidate or trying to kind of like aggregate uh, multiple or just one type of contract. Because bear in mind that these contract, these schemas could be updated over time, right? They could be upgraded to different types of schemas. So one uh, one NFT from a contract might be might have a different uh, NFT schema if there is at some point in the future like a rollout of an upgrade. Uh, and therefore, like more fields might be added on, uh, whereas like previous ones might not have had it had it. So the schema kind of changing uh, throughout the lifespan of like ads NFTs get minted could be potentially interesting. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think all of that could be supported just natively. You know, so um, I guess I guess here's here's my my thought process, and and it could go either way. So I saw basically the question was, you know, if we had the separate JSON schema. How would it get parsed? Is it you know could could the 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 subgraph 
kind of dynamically generate the tables for the fields and um, and the subgraph can't dynamically generate tables. The, the schema is something that needs to be like part of the subgraph definition. Um, but uh, what you could do is have tooling on top that like, you know, generates a new subgraph for you based on like parsing, say, a, you know, schema.org schema, and then it could kind of like generate the corresponding GraphQL API for you. So you could build some tooling around that. Um, and then the question is, you know, is, is that worth it or uh, is that just kind of like, you know, redundant in a, in a sense, because, you know, GraphQL itself is introspectable. So, you know, you, you can introspect to see like, you know, the whole schema, um, you know, subgraphs are upgradable. So, um, you know, you can have different versions of a subgraph and, you know, um, I don't know that you can do it today, but you could imagine, you know, being able to like query for like the history of a subgraph to get past versions, see the past schemas, things like that. So um, I guess it's, it's an open question depending on what other use cases you'd wanna use the raw you know, JSON schema version to see whether it's adding enough or whether it might be worth just kind of having these schemas defined in GraphQL. Well, I, I think um, the reason why it needs to be defined outside of um, app GraphQL is like there are many different ways in code that you may want to consume the metadata. And I think the subgraph is like lower down the stack, but like there are plenty of applications that might want to consume data from an NFT that doesn't use a subgraph, for example. Sure. And, and they need to, in that context, be able to parse and understand different types of metadata and what the field expected fields are, right? And so I think that's the primary motivation for having like a central source of truth in a, in a schema repository. Um, and then, you know, when, when, when updates to the schema are made, they can propagate down to a subgraph in other, in other contexts in which that, that core data would be consumed. Okay. Are you looking at storing that um, repository itself on kind of a, a decentralized platform of sorts? Right, right now it's on GitHub. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of Sam. Um, I do think that would be amazing. Yeah, I think like as like a bootstrap, um, there's obviously, yeah, it, you know, GitHub is like a straightaway. I think there is definitely, I think, yeah, there's a lot of value in storing it decentralized uh, to match the whole rest of the ecosystem. So yeah, I would push for it to be stored decentral uh, stored decentralized as well. Yeah, so, so that, that could be something to, to work towards. And, and you know, I, I buy that there's kind of, you know, value there and kind of having the, the raw kind of storage schema, if you will, um, you know, ha have that represented separately using something like uh, JSON schema. And so, so then I think uh, the approach would be uh, to build tooling around kind of like auto generating a subgraph based on that, where, you know, it can generate the GraphQL schema that you want based on the JSON schema. And then it would just be, uh, um, you know, an, an, an upgrade to the subgraph whenever, whenever new types are added. So, yeah. so, so how does that work if like many NFTs can have many types of metadata, metadata? Um, cause right, like we're not, it's not an enforceable thing at the protocol to say that like the URI that this NFT is attached to must conform to the schema. So like anyone could put in anything at the URI and the challenge that I keep, I don't under, fully understand is how the subgraph would be able to parse and store data uh, according to a schema that it doesn't necessarily know it will conf like conform to. I think, yeah. at, I think at that point, I think it's um, at that point, it'd be up to, you know, whoever's maintaining the subgraph to, to do that translation. And I think the, the, like the reason for doing it is just to make sure consumers of, of those subgraphs um, have like a standardized way of reading it. So I think the onus is on, on the subgraph maintainer. Um, so I think it'd be like, you would have knowledge of how you're storing things on chain um, and on IPFS, and then you would index it in a way that you think it's like adheres to the standard so that like consumers have, have a predictable path. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, that, that, that's kind of like a, a general philosophical issue with kind of structured versus unstructured data, yeah. right? If, if the data is unstructured, 
then uh, you either have to have that knowledge of the application or you have to do more brittle kind of like, you know, processing. Um, and that's kind of the trade-off. Um, and so in, in general, you know, I think we're, we're in favor of structured data. You know, I think like it, it yeah. just makes things more sane. And so, you know, wherever you can do things like have a field that describes the type of the metadata or something like that, that then just like mm -hmm. allows it to be a pretty like dry deterministic parsing kind of a process, uh, that's an improvement. Um, if you don't have that, then you know you you can write more brittle code that basically introspects it tries to parse it you know potentially fails looks for specific fields based on that like makes kind of you know heuristic decisions of like what am i looking at um that, yeah. could, that you, you you can do that in mapping um but it just makes things a little bit messier yep I see someone um, dropped a schema that GraphQL um, for the metadata. Does someone want to talk, chat through that? Sam, if you scroll down, I think, uh, yeah, right there, someone dropped, uh, whoever did that, do they want to chat about what they're, what they're thinking here? It seems like, a, I, I do think we, we want to drive towards like, um, yeah. like a, a subgraph schema here. Yeah, it, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same uh, schema that uh, some proposed, but just uh, related to a, a GraphQL schema, having the, a particular base metadata interface and having a particular type for each uh, um, uh, known uh, metadata. So probably this is a draft. It's not the uh, final version. I just uh, posted to provide an idea on on that. Uh, hopefully for, for next meeting, I will share with you um, a, a small uh, proof concept of that, having a, a couple of JSON file lists, uh, supporting different metadata and parsing it in a nest graph. Cool, yeah, this, this is cool. Um, I just wanted to chime in on uh, kind of a few specific things. Um, I'm working on Glass, which is a video protocol, and we actually want to have uh, multi-modal multi um, content types. So the video file itself, and then also a sprite sheet, um, like so, like video thumbnails um, associated with that content. So any advice on structuring that while conforming to standards? And another point that I thought was pretty interesting, but we've actually already received requests for localization. So actually, uh, you know, supporting multiple languages and local characters. I know this is slightly specific, but um, I think like if we're really going for, you know, scale and supporting a lot of users, having that sort of support early on might be useful. Yeah, I'll, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let others speak to the first. Um, I can say, I think uh, localization is, is definitely something that we should tackle kind of protocol wide. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good point to follow up on, you know, you can almost have a, a whole working group just kind of on that. Uh, but it would be nice to have standards, like kind of interfaces kind of applying across the board that allows you to like, um, for example, even, you know, when you're running a query, be able to like filter on, you know, a language and then get, get the right results for that language. Yeah, I, th I think to the first one, um, where essentially you have kind of like multiple different outputs, like of the source. So um, I think, yeah, there's a very naive take on this that I kind of added in here, and it is by no means like a, a kind of well thought out solution. Um, but I imagine there being like, and resolutions again is like a terrible name, but um, some kind of key value store where there's like kind of like, key values of like common or like agree pre-agreed upon different either like resolutions or like sprite sheets or um you know high definition low definition like a 3d like you can imagine with video like there could be hdr there could be kind of like 3d like there's all types of like different core formats that need to be considered that a video could be available in um so i think like some kind of like key mapping could go a long way there um, and I think this is where like the ability to compose and like build upon is kind of quite core cool because for example, like your solution might have like many different types of formats that are specific to you in the video realm. Um, it, even in like your video realm compared to 
other video kind of like dApps that are out there or protocols that are kind of like coming out. So having, you know, the ability to kind of like have a base layer and then compose on top of that, um, I think is kind of pretty crucial for anything moving forward. Yeah. But yeah, well, if we can kind of like agree to something on a lower level, then even better. But sounds good. Um, inheritance might be interesting, but I think that would be difficult with uh, GraphQL. I'm not sure. Um, another just like to share knowledge, uh, we've been doing a lot of experiments with video, and um, HLS seems to work very well over over IPFS, um, better than MP4. That's just very like, interesting to know. As an aside, yeah. How, so are you storing the renditions in IPFS then? Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, great. Well, um, we're getting towards the end of time here. So you know, I feel like the, the weekly cadence um, feels like a lot generally. I also know that the NFT space is moving super fast and it, it feels like we, we never run out of things to talk about. So, you know, I'm for, for keeping it. Um, if, if you guys are, I feel like we can continue from here uh, next week. And, um, you know, we can try to, to work on a, um, an agenda uh, over the Telegram ahead of time. Um, if people have things that come up during the week that they want to make sure that they have a chance to, uh, to discuss on the call. Does that sound good? All right, awesome. Well, super productive day and, uh, you know, special shout out to the foundation team for doing such a great job capturing all of those, um, you know, proposals from, from uh, the, the last call. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, see you at next week's call. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I guess. Bye. Bye -bye. Thanks.